Hey, it's Andre for the High Performance Academy and I'm here with Scotty from Insight Motorsport. Scotty's the tuner for the Tilton Interiors Evo, which has just set a new lap record here for World Time Attack with a 124.8. How do you feel about that, Scotty? Uh, we were celebrating quite a lot, actually. Um, very, very happy. It's been a long ride for the last few years and, and now we've done it, so very proud of the boys and uh, yeah, we're looking forward to tomorrow as well. Now, the Tilden Interiors car seems like it's come a hell of a long way in the last 12 months since it competed here last year. Can you give us a, a little bit of a rundown on, on what happened over those 12 months? I mean, I, I know the car's been to Japan and competed over there. Um, give, us, give us a little bit of a rundown. Well, uh, firstly, uh, Costa, the owner from Tilton Interiors, he decided to uh, take the car to Japan, take it to who he felt were the best uh, aero um, people in the business, is Voltex. And uh, we went there to have a bit of a, a shakedown of Sakuba, and uh, we had a, not a very good time of it. And uh, we left the vehicle there um, looking very dejected. <laughs> and uh, Voltex came back with an aero package which just sort of really blew us all away. Um, I think that's the biggest, the biggest improvement that's been made on the car. Lots of other mechanical changes have been made, minor and um, some major. Uh, engine development, we've been sort of just changing the engine packages slowly over the years and this year we've put the new Bourgogne EFR 9180 on the car. Uh, Hypertune have developed their latest range of uh, exhaust manifolds which has helped us sort of unleash that extra horsepower. We've also been struggling in the past with boost response and, uh, and that's sort of hurt the potential for the car along with the aerodynamics that that weren't really up to the, the top level that we required to, to try to be competitive against the big guns. Yeah, I, I know last year the, the car looked a, a hell of a lot more like a, a standard road going Evo than it, and it does now. Um, Aero is, is really the, the big buzzword around World Time Attack and we've seen some crazy cars in the, in the pro class. Um, you know, how, how important is a competitive and effective Aero package to actually be at the pointy end of the field? I think to be at the pointy end of the field there is no choice but to go to the absolute best aerodynamics package you can find. However, uh, our car since it's been built has lacked uh, high-end aerodynamics and it's only last year where we had some help from Voltex who really sort of started to step up the game for us with aerodynamics. However, it was not integrated in the car from the, the start, so it was, it was compromised. And uh, we sort of worked hard on the mechanical side of things to get the car, uh, the mechanical grip, braking and, and other sort of issues and, and getting the weight of the car down. So that's what's um, helped us get to the point where we can at least um, get an aerodynamics package that's going to help complement what's already sort of been mechanically quite good. But uh, yeah, of course, aerodynamics, you, you, you won't win without. Now, I, I understand when Voltex had the car over in Japan, um, it actually went on into a wind tunnel as well. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. Uh, they have done quite a bit of testing before and after, and uh, they have a good idea of how the car was going to perform. Uh, and uh, even us, we were sort of reasonably sceptical at, at what they were going to promise us for the car. And um, yeah, they've obviously delivered well and truly. Do, do we have any numbers for outright downforce? Um, no, that would be proprietary information that you, you would probably have to ask them and I, I doubt very much that they would be willing to give it away. I understand, I understand. Okay, let's look at uh, the, the power package though. So we've got a Mitsubishi 4G63 engine in there. You've said you've got the new EFR turbocharger on a Hypertune exhaust manifold. Uh, what, what sort of power can, can you expect out of that engine and what sort of boost pressure are you running it at? Um, this engine at the moment, uh, the turbocharger, although it's claimed to be rated at 1,000 horsepower, uh, our data suggests that possibly 950 horsepower is achievable. Uh, we haven't gone anywhere near trying to push that at this stage. Uh, our dyno tuning is generally very, very minimal, and we generally only tune enough to get the car in a position to be able to get it to the track and do the real tuning at the track. Uh, a lot of this is to do with uh, the clutch system that we have is, and the, the drivetrain, and it's not very suitable to be sort of running hours and hours on hours on the, the dyno. So we get enough of a baseline on the dyno and then we go to the track and we refine from there. But uh, our horsepower readings are 600 horsepower at the wheels on 32 PSI and uh, we run higher than that as we go through the, uh, the events. 
So at, at the moment the car is currently running on around 36 psi and we estimate that to be around 860 to 870 horsepower at the engine. It's a, it's a fairly serious 4G63. Uh, take it you are using a, a fuel such as E85 to do that sort of job? Oh, of course, yes. We uh, use E85 race fuel, uh, like most of the competitors here. Now, to, to go from the dyno with just a basic tune-up and then go to the track, you've obviously got some fairly serious uh, hardcore data logging on the car so you can actually effectively tune the car at the track. Can you give us a rundown um, on, on what data you're actually you've, you're taking out of the car? Uh, this car has a full package of MoTeC. Uh, we have uh, an ADL3 um, dash logger, uh, M800 ECU, uh, and CDI ignition system and, and all the other sort of accompanying electronics which are integrated in the car. Now we basically log almost anything that you could think about and uh, my part of it from the tuning point of view, my job is mainly to take care of the engine um, package and to ensure that the driver has the ability to deliver all that power down to the track. So I talked to the, um, the, the chief uh, race engineer, Louis, who handles the chassis and the driver. And we also coordinate how the engine performance is going to be integrated into the car for any session. So generally what we do is we will, over the course of the, of the event, we will look to the engine power after we've refine the rest of the car and the driver and make sure that the engine is, is, is happy enough um, to keep doing laps. So basically you're going to get the chassis and the driver sorted out first so he's comfortable in the car and it's performing. Once you've got that all sorted out then you're going to start increasing the, the power. Yes most definitely however when I mean uh, we're not going to go out with like a uh, low tune even the, what we consider the low tune is still quite high in horsepower, uh, so we're talking the last 100 horsepower which we're dialing into the engine, because if you go with a, not enough horsepower, you'll find that any settings and setup that you come up with are just not relevant when you push the, the boundaries further. So we still have to get to a point where we're managing the, uh, the engine life, because these engines, from our own experience from years of racing these cars, are are quite fragile when you push them to the upper thresholds of horsepower, no matter how good everything is. No, un understood. Can we talk a little bit about the drivetrain in the car? I notice you've got paddles uh, behind the steering wheel, so it's a paddle shift gearbox. What, what sort of gearbox are you running? Uh, this has a Hollinger six-speed six sequential. Uh, we have a paddle shift system which we're trialling. We also have the stick shift as well. The car is currently running with the stick shift. So we've had some uh, minimal testing on the paddle shift. We've only just had it running the last five, five to seven days. So we've made a decision to stick with the stick shift for this event. Um, and we have done some testing with the paddle shift, but the driver still is uh, not used to the uh, paddles yet. And we haven't got the electronics uh, and the setup of the mechanics of the car just right to, to justify staying with the paddle shift system at this time. I think when I was looking at the car earlier I noticed that it have a um, electronic throttle body on it, drive-by-wire throttle body on it? Uh, yes, this has had a drive-by-wire throttle since it's been built and uh, uses an AP pedal box with, uh, we have some linear pots which uh, allow us to monitor the pedal and uh, that goes to the ECU obviously and, and, um, and we can do sort of all sorts of little tricks with, with a throttle to uh, try to get as much power down to the ground as we can. Are you using the uh, downshaft throttle blip through the MoTeC when you are using the pedals? Uh, yes, we do. Yes, of course. So that's very important, and uh, it's quite tricky to to get that synchronised into the car. Uh, it's going to take a little bit of time before we can get our head around that system, but uh, it, it it may well be an advantage in the future for sure. With the pedal shift, is the driver still required to use the clutch on a downshift? Uh, no, not at all. Okay, so how are you uh, how are you integrating that? Is the, is it uh, just with the dog box? There's no need to use the clutch on that downshift. Basically, with the dog box, yes. Uh, the the driver does uh, at at times decide to use the clutch if and when he feels necessary, and uh, even with the way the, the he drives the car, he may feel the need to use the clutch as well. So when the car comes into the pits after a session. You're downloading the data out of it. What are the first things you're looking at, given that your main interest is, is engine safety, engine reliability? What are, you, what are you looking at in the data? Well, in, test, there's, in testing, we will generally bring the vehicle in 
uh, and we'll pull the data out and the only thing that I'm really looking at the first is the health of the engine to determine whether it's okay to go out for the next test session. If in this event it's really just one run per session, so when it comes in and we bring the data log out, we're, we're not that concerned with instantly looking at the, the, uh, the engine health in a sense. I will have a a quick look at it just to make sure that the boys have got it, an opportunity to fix anything in between sessions if need be. Uh, but we will go upstairs and, and into a quiet area with the race engineer and the driver and we'll have a look through the data and then we'll um, make sure the health's okay and, and we'll pass on messages to the crew uh, if there's anything we feel that's, that's, that's unusual or different from what we're used to seeing and um, they can get onto it while we're still working on trying to make the car faster. With tuning for such a specific type of event with Time Attack, really it's all about that one flying lap. Is there anything specific you're, you're doing differently in your tuning philosophy than, than what you do for, say, a, a normal regular circuit, circuit racing car? Are you tuning the car harder for that one flying lap? Or is, is it safe enough that the driver could go out there and complete 10 laps at full power and everything would be just, just safe? Uh, what you will find is when, depending on the boost levels we're running, but uh, in testing we will generally look to make sure that the engine is as reliable as possible, so we're not abs chasing the absolute maximum horsepower. And even in the event, we're not chasing the maximum horsepower. So it's much more like a circuit car in terms of the actual tuning philosophy to uh, make sure that it keeps going around the track because the horsepower is generally in abundance and it's more about managing getting that horsepower to the track then trying to find every little bit of horsepower you can find. But what you will see is that we will make a more uh, intense effort of improving the engine horsepower as the event evolves and as we, you know, we refine the vehicle through the course of the weekend. So you will see us pushing harder and harder towards the end. So on that basis, I'm guessing the uh, 124.8's still nothing on what we can expect out of the car tomorrow. Um, with so much power on tap, are you using anything like speed or gear dependent boost control to increase the engine power as the, as the car goes faster and obviously that downforce comes into play more and more? Uh, yes we do. Um, we play quite a bit with uh, boost mapping and it's more around trying to make the car as much drivable as possible. Uh, with the aerodynamics this year, that's made it a hell of a lot easier to, to put the power down and hence we can be a little bit more aggressive with the delivery. Uh, in the past, it's been a very fine balance between trying to get the horsepower into the car and getting the turbo onto boost and so forth and getting that traction and getting the drive and making it, uh, it's, it's made it a lot difficult to drive. So as you, you will find, as we push harder, the car will get harder and it, it will look more ugly, if you will, to drive. So we are doing things to try to manage the horsepower down to the track, for sure. Okay. Now I noticed in the engine bay you've got exhaust gas temperature sensors in each runner of the exhaust manifold. That's quite common on drag cars, but I don't see that as often in circuit cars. How critical is that in your tuning? What sort of uh, trim percentages are you adding across the four cylinders to equalise those temperatures? We generally try to ensure there is minimal trim as possible to, uh, to maintain tune. So if, if we feel that there's a, enough differentiation between the cylinders, then it's more likely there's something wrong with the, the package. Uh, be it maybe an injector or a cylinder's going bad or something like that. So we use it more for uh, monitoring things and certainly overseeing the tune-up. But it's not the there's so many factors that come into play with an EGT. So you can't say, okay, with well, this EGT is this temperature, it equals this. It, there, there are a lot of factors that you need to to look into. So it's only one sensor um, package which integrates into the rest of the vehicle. That's great. Look, Scotty, I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today. The car is amazing. You've obviously done an exceptional job with the tune-up and it's just working for you. You guys are having a great weekend so far. I really hope that everything continues and you go even faster tomorrow. Thanks a lot. Nice talking to you. Cheers. For online tuning courses, visit learntotune.com.